We know God by his effects. If this is a creation, and it is, that's an effect, we ought to reason back to a cause, a creator. Yet scientists seem to be telling us that science can somehow explain all these effects we see. And actually what I think they're doing is atheists are stealing from God while they're arguing against him. Ladies and gentlemen, how do you know that God exists? This is the interactive portion of the program. How do you know that he exists? All right, I hear creation. Objective truth. What's that? Because you exist. Experienced him. As we talked about last night briefly, we know God by his effects. If this is a creation, and it is, that's an effect, we ought to reason back to a cause, a creator. If there's design, as Steve Meyer talks about in Return to the God Hypothesis and his other books, then there must be a designer. The effect is design, the cause is a designer. If there's a moral law written on our hearts, that's the effect. We reason back to a cause, a moral law. If we have the capacity to reason... And there are these immaterial laws of logic out there that we can access with our minds. That's the effect. We reason back to a cause, a great mind. If a man predicted and accomplished his own resurrection from the dead, that's the effect. We reason back to a cause of being like God. Who else could resurrect somebody from the dead? Even James Torr said it can't be done, right? When he said, you got a living thing, you kill it. you got all the chemicals there. Why doesn't it resurrect it itself? Because... Molecules don't go in the direction of making life. So you've got to have a cause for an effect. Yet scientists seem to be telling us that science can somehow explain all these effects we see. And actually what I think they're doing is atheists are stealing from God while they're arguing against him. And in the book Stealing from God we have an acronym, CRIME, C-R-I-M-E-S, and these Letters stand for a different aspect of reality that I think atheists say point away from God when in fact none of these things would exist unless God existed. The C stands for causality, the R reason, the I information, M morality, E evil, and S science. And science is our subject today. Atheists try and say that science has somehow disproven God my view is, is that science would be impossible unless God existed. And as I say, this comes from the book, Stealing from God, Why Atheists Need God to Make Their Case. And I think there may be a few books back there. By the way, all the proceeds from the sale of the books will go to feed needy children. Mine. Okay? <laughs> Just so you know. I got three sons, so I need some help. Actually, no, they're going to the Discovery Institute. All right? That's where all of the proceeds go. So here's what I want to talk about. Why Science Needs God, and you see there's a different title on this, but we'll get to the title here a little bit later. We're going to try and do this in three steps. First step is what is science? Second step is what does science say about God? And then thirdly, why does science need God? So let's start right here at point one. What is science? Now if someone were to stick a microphone in front of your face, uh, uh, like a man on the street interview, and ask you, hey, what is science? What would you say? Knowledge, well that's what the word means, knowledge, right? Cause and effect in the natural world. Do you, do you realize there is actually no agreed upon definition of science? That's why sometimes the Discovery Institute is labeled as pseudoscience, right? It's not really science. Where other people will say, no, it's, it is science. I think we could use sort of a minimalist interpretation of science. It's sort of Francis Bacon... Bacon's definition, and he was a founder of modern science, he would say something like, science is a method of inquiry used to discover cause and effect relationships. So at a minimum, when you're doing science, you're trying to discover what particular cause caused a particular effect. You're searching for causes, in other words. And there are at least two types of causes. There are intelligent causes, a person doing something, that's what Titus is trying to discover when he does archaeology, right? He sees an inscription, 
Well, he's got to figure that's got to be a personal cause. The other type of cause is a non-intelligent cause or a natural process. Now, how many people here have uh, ever been to the Grand Canyon? Right? It's a beautiful geologic formation. But when you try and search for a cause for the Grand Canyon, do you have to posit an intelligent cause or, say, a natural cause? Do you have to posit that some intelligent creature put its finger down in the canyon to create it? Or might you say that wind, rain, erosion, maybe a great flood could create a canyon, right? You'd probably say B, okay? You don't need an intelligent being to create the Grand Canyon. But can everybody see the difference between this geologic formation and this geologic formation? <laughs> Mount Rushmore, right? When you look at Mount Rushmore, you know that wasn't created by erosion. Not natural erosion, maybe political erosion. But you know that an intelligent being had to create those faces on Mount Rushmore. And all we're saying here is that the Grand Canyon is an example of a natural process or a natural cause, whereas uh, Mount Rushmore would be the, an example of an intelligent cause. Now, there are two types of science in addition to two types of causes. For example, an empirical science, which is what gen people generally in, the, in our culture think science is, that's how things operate. Like, how does a car operate? How does a Model T operate? That's a different question, however, than the other type of science, which asks, how did things originate? Where did the Model T come from? It, these have been uh, termed by different or defined by different terms. Sometimes people will say historic science is, uh, say, uh, origin science or maybe forensic science. You know, this is studying the past, where empirical science studies how things operate routinely. How does a car operate? And we might say that the empirical science gives us technology, uh, how do cars operate, how do iPhones operate, and do you realize that nobody is arguing over, say, how air conditioning works, or how iPhones work, or how medical technology works, or how cars work. There's not Christians arguing with atheists over these issues, right? We're not arguing over empirical questions. What are we arguing over? We're arguing over creation questions, origin questions. We're arguing about how things happened in the past. We're not arguing how things operate now. And John Lennox, who as you know taught at Oxford for many years, gives his students a thought experiment. He says, suppose you have a Model T in front of you. What could account for the Model T? Henry Ford or the laws of internal combustion? You can only pick one. And Lennox says, his students always say, uh, Dr. Lennox, you actually need both. You need Henry Ford to create the Model T, and then you need the laws of internal combustion to do what they do in order for the Model T to operate. If the laws of internal combustion changed every five seconds, the Model T wouldn't work, right? So you need both causes for the Model T to exist to begin with and then to operate properly. And he says, why can my students see that, but Dawkins and Dennett and other atheistic scientists can't see this distinction? There's a distinction between how things originated and how things operate. And we're going to be talking about how things operate. In fact, we might say this. To say that science can disprove the existence of God is, is like saying that a mechanic can disprove the existence of Henry Ford. Right? Just because you know how that Model T works, does that mean you can explain away Henry Ford? Of course not. Those two scientific questions, how things operate and how things work, or I should say how things operate and how things originated, are two different questions. And the questions that create all the controversy are not how things work generally, they're how things originated. So we're looking at an historical science. Here's the problem. Many scientists, particularly atheistic scientists, will use the prestige of empirical science, technology, to try and get the general public to think everything we say about historic science should be taken as gospel. 
when in fact these are two completely different questions and it, they require two different approaches to discover the right answer in each of these two categories. So don't let people, scientists, atheistic scientists, use the prestige of empirical science to get you to believe that what they're saying about origin science is correct. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. You have to look at the evidence and discover whether or not it makes sense, all right? So what is science? It's a search for causes. Two types of causes, natural and intelligent. Two types of science, origin science or historic science and operation or empirical science. You with me so far? All right, next question, what does science say about God? And in order to do this, we got to go back to OJ. <laughs> OJ. Now, some people in here have never heard of OJ Simpson. Who's never heard of OJ Simpson in here? Don't know anything about OJ Simpson. Okay. A few of us, a few of you youngsters. OJ Simpson was one of the best running backs in NFL history. He ran for many years for the Buffalo Bills. This is back in, say, in the 70s. Uh, before that, he was at USC. He won the Heisman Trophy. After he retired, he was a sideline reporter for the NFL. And in 1994, his wife and her boyfriend, his ex-wife and her boyfriend, were brutally murdered in Brentwood, California. It was a slash and dash murder. Blood everywhere, obviously. Both of these individuals were brutally knifed. And OJ was seen as the prime suspect. And as you can see, the Newsweek article here said trail of blood. And there really, literally was a trail of blood from that crime scene all the way to O.J. And here is some of the evidence that they found. O.J. Simpson's blood was at the crime scene. There's only a 1 in 170 million chance it was not his blood. Secondly, Ron Goldman, who was killed... Uh, Nicole Brown Simpson, that's O.J.'s ex-wife, and Simpson's blood were in Simpson's white Bronco. For those who are old enough, you remember there was a low-speed chase on the L.A. freeways, not because of a traffic jam, but because uh, they were tracking O.J. and he was in the back of this, he was in the back of this Bronco, and a friend of his was driving it, and he was going to kill himself in the back of the. I mean, I don't have time to get all the details, but it was high TV to say the least. Uh, the glove at the crime scene had blood from all three and matched the glove at Simpson's house. When OJ was on the sidelines at the NFL, he you, you would wear these like isotoner gloves when he's holding the microphone. And one of those gloves were found at the crime scene. It had blood from all three of them on it. And there was another glove at his house that matched that glove. Then there was a bloody footprints at the crime scene were from a rare brand of size 12 shoes that Simpson owned. There were only 199 pairs of these shoes sold in the United States, and Simpson had one of them, and his footprints were found at the crime scene. Also, Brown's blood was on Simpson's socks. There's only a 1 in 21 million chance... It wasn't her blood. Now here's my question. Does science show he was guilty? How many say, yep, guilty? How many say, no? How many say, it's a trap! Don't answer! <laughs> yeah, it's actually a trap. Why? The reason is, is because science doesn't say anything scientists do. Science doesn't say a word. This is just data. First of all, you got to discover whether this data is accurate. And then secondly, you got to you make a judgment. Does this data point more clearly to his guilt or maybe to his innocence? How could he be innocent? Well, maybe, the, maybe the evidence was planted. You had that racist Mark Furman on the LAPD... Maybe he planted this. Maybe there's other explanations. The data doesn't tell you that, does it? The data simply is raw, and then you need to try and judge the data. You need to interpret the data. And in fact, your worldview can determine how you interpret the data. In fact, there was a survey done. 
by Newsweek magazine 10 years after the murders. Here's what they found. 77% believe Simpson was guilty. Oh, before I go there, whatever happened with the trial? Does anyone know? <laughs> what happened was, oh, you guys know about the glove, don't you? Johnny Cochran, his defense attorney, was very astute because that glove they found at the crime scene, he was going to, OJ was going to try on during the trial. And at the opportune time, he tried the glove on. And before he tried the glove on, Johnny Cochran said, if the glove doesn't fit, you need to acquit. So he, OJ had this, and by, every, by, the way, by the way, everybody loved OJ. OJ was like a hero, okay? So he's got this, this uh, kind of uh, surgical glove on, and he starts to try and put this glove found at the crime scene on, and he couldn't put it on. Why couldn't he put it on? Well, he didn't want to put it on, yeah. But secondly, the, the glove had shrunk because of all the blood on it. So he couldn't put that glove on, and as you said, he didn't want to put it on. So after the whole trial went through, O.J. was not found innocent. What was he found? Not guilty. You can't, you can't say he was innocent, but what you can say is the evidence did not acquit or did not uh, convict him, according to the jury. Now, CNN later did a whole... Uh, documentary on this and they interviewed all the jurors and they found that no matter what the evidence, even if they had video evidence, they never would have convicted OJ. Okay. OJ later went to jail for another reason, but he's free. He's a free man right now. Okay. Anyway, here's what they found. 77% believed Simpson was guilty, but there was an ethnic divide. 87% of whites thought he was guilty, where only 27% or 29% of blacks thought he was guilty. Why, do you think? Everybody's looking at the same evidence. But people might be coming at it from different worldview perspectives. Blacks had often seen them treated immorally by having evidence planted against them. Where whites hadn't seen that. So when they look at the evidence, the blacks are going, I don't know, man, he might not be guilty. Whites are going, no, he's guilty. Why? Because the worldview, your experience, might determine how you interpret the evidence. Now let's apply this to evolution for a second. Here's Piltdown Man. How many, how many people have heard, heard of Piltdown Man? You know what Piltdown Man is? Well, it's a fake, but it was found in 1912, a discovery in Piltdown, England. The British Museum reconstructed fragments of a skull and jawbone and held it as a link between ape and man. The problem was, it was revealed to be a hoax in 1923. It was a combination of a human skull, orangutan jaw, and chimpanzee teeth, but the scientific community did not admit it until 30 years later. Why? Because they already knew evolution was true in their own minds. So it had to be evidence of macroevolution. Don't let the facts get in the way of a good ideology here. We already know the truth. This has to be evidence for it. Who put up the uh, slide earlier? I think it was uh, Dr. Jim Tor, that quote from Max Planck, who said basically scientific cheery, uh, theories change when the old guard die off. These people are invested in this. So they're not going to let their ideology go unless some dramatic change comes about. The bottom line is your worldview may determine how you interpret the evidence. In fact, I think that's what causes Richard Dawkins to believe in macroevolution. This is many years ago. One of the founders of the modern intelligent design movement, in addition to Bill Dembski, was Philip Johnson who was an attorney and taught at UCAL berserkly. And he, some of you will get that tomorrow. <laughs> he wrote a book in 1991 called Darwin on Trial, where he just took the evidence and he used his own logical reasoning skills, his attorney skills, to see if Darwin's 
Darwin on trial would, would go through. Would, do they have good evidence or not? And at one point he emailed Richard Dawkins and he asked Dawkins this question. Just bottom line me, Richard. Give me the best evidence you have for macroevolution. Why do you think it's true? And here is what Dawkins said. The reason we know for certain we are all related, including bacteria, is the universality of the genetic code and other biochemical fundamentals. You know, got this common genetic code. Now, in reality, there isn't no common genetic code. There are many genetic codes, but there is a dominant one, so we'll give Dawkins some grace here. He's saying, since we all share this common genetic code, we must be ancestrally related. You know what? Does the, does the evidence tell you that's, that's the conclusion? No, that's only one way to interpret the evidence. What could be another way to interpret the evidence? Right, it could be a common creator, a common designer. You see, but Dawkins has already ruled that out. He's already said there can't be a designer. So it doesn't matter how much evidence comes across him that points towards intelligence. He's going to say, no, it's got to be a natural cause. Remember, there's only two causes. Natural, non-natural, or intelligent or non-intelligent. We might say natural. If you rule out one before you look at the evidence, how are you always going to interpret the data? It's got to be a natural cause. That's a philosophical presupposition. That's not a result of the evidence. And you can't do science without philosophy. Science is built on philosophy. This is why Einstein famously said, unfortunately, the man of science is often a poor philosopher. Because you have to gather data and then interpret data. And who does that? Science doesn't do that. Scientists do that. And if the scientist has already ruled out one of only two possible interpretations, is it any wonder he always assumes it's got to be a natural cause? In fact, you might ask yourself the question, just how did we get here? Well, when you boil all of the arguments for macroevolution down, neo-Darwinism, I think you can put them in two basic categories are DNA and homology. So what Dawkins is talking about, this common genetic code, and then homology, which is basically structure. You know, we have a common structure. We do have, you know, we, we do look like we could have evolved from apes. That certainly is possible, or from a common ancestor, right? Because we have a common structure. And so what the evolutionists might say is this points to a common ancestor. And they could be right. But you might ask them, well, why a common ancestor and not a common designer? Well, because evolution's true. Well, how do you know evolution's true? Because of DNA and homology. Can anyone see this is called circular reasoning? You would need evidence outside of DNA and homology because that evidence could go either way, correct? When you look at things like irreducible complexity and epigenetic information and the Cambrian explosion, the fossil record, and other items, I think the evidence points clearly in the other direction that there's got to be an intelligence. And of course, DNA itself, a code, as Stephen has already said, is evidence of intelligence itself because codes come from coders. Programs come from programmers. Messages come from minds. So what's the bottom line to this section? What does science say about God? You know what the answer is? Nothing. Because science doesn't say anything about anything. It's scientists that say things. Now I think, properly interpreted, scientific evidence can point toward a supreme intelligent being. It's not going to get you all the way to Jesus. Why? Because if you look at, say, the creation of the universe and space, matter, and time had a beginning out of nothing, which is what the evidence seems to show, we know the cause must be spaceless, timeless, immaterial, powerful, personal, and intelligent. But we don't know if this is Allah. We don't know if this is Jesus. We don't know if this is some other deistic or theistic generic God. In order to discover whether or not it's the Christian God, you need some historical information. And that's why you've got to look into the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus. Now, I think when you do that, 
I think you can realize that the same being that walked out of the tomb 1,990 years ago is the same being in whose divine nature created the universe out of nothing. You don't get there with any scientific argument. You get six attributes from just the cosmological argument, which show you it could be the God of the Bible, but you don't know it is until you look at some other evidence, all right? So now let's go to why does science need God? And we talked about this last night briefly. When somebody says all truth comes from science, this is scientism, by the way, what question are you going to ask that person? Yeah, is that a scientific truth? Can you go in the laboratory and prove this claim? No, that's a philosophical claim. And what you want to do when people utter things like this is you want to turn the claim on itself. Because this claim right here defeats itself. That claim right there is not a truth from science. It's actually a truth about science. And it happens to be false. Because the most important things in life, by the way, have nothing to do with science. Honey, do you love me? Yeah. Why? I don't know. Let's run an experiment. No! I mean, that's not, that's not what it's all about, okay? So you might say, okay, science, we don't get all our truth from science. Well, what, what can't science explain? Now, I was going to show you this video, but since we don't have audio, I can't show you. How many of you have seen this uh, video between uh, at Peter Atkins and William Lane Craig? Have you seen this debate? Okay, this debate, I actually happened with, I was at this debate in 1998 in, in Atlanta, Georgia, where William Lane Craig and Peter Atkins were debating. And at one point, Peter Atkins asked Bill Craig here, do you deny that all truth comes from science. And William Lane Craig said, yes, I deny that all truth comes from science. And then Atkins said, well, what truth do you get that isn't from science? And then Craig, as he's saying right here in Spanish subtitles, just for your benefit, um, goes into a, a eloquent five-point re rebuttal of what, of what uh, Atkins had tried to say that all truth comes from science. And basically, here's what he says. He says that science can't explain logical and mathematical truths. Why? Because you need those things in order to do science. You can't go in the laboratory and prove those things by science. You need them in order to do some sort of experiment. Same thing is true with metaphysical truths. Like there's a real world out there that you can ascertain outside of your skull. That moral and ethical truths, such as murder, is wrong. You don't get that from science. In fact, science is amoral. You have to import morality into science. Because Joseph Mengele was a scientist, right? Was he a good or bad scientist? You don't get that from science itself. You have to import morality from outside of science. Aesthetic truths, and of course, science itself. Why science itself? Because science is built on philosophical principles that you need in order to actually get any results. And this is an image from the book Stealing from God. My friend Jay Warner Wallace, who's an artist as well, drew this for me. I wanted to point out that all of these philosophical presuppositions you see here under this scientist are assumed before you can actually frame a scientific investigation, conduct it, or interpret it. You've got to assume morality, because you can't put, you don't get morality from a test tube. You've got to bring morality to the scientific endeavor. Also, free will. You've got to have free will to follow the evidence where it leads. You can't be a molecular machine and follow the evidence where it leads. Logic, realism, uniformity. Steve has been talking about that. That causes in the past must be ca like causes in the present. The present is the key to the past. How are we going to know uh, that life could not have originated um, by natural processes in the past if things in the past work differently than they do now? We can't know. We have to assume that in the past, the natural laws that run the universe now are the same natural laws that ran it in the past. Otherwise, we can't get at the past. That's a, that's a philosophical presupposition. You can't prove that. You have to assume it. Also, reason, orderly natural laws and causality. Let's just look at a couple of these for a second. Let's look at reason. 
Do you know that materialists think that all thoughts are determined by the laws of physics? In other words, you may think you have free will, you may think you're reasoning, but you're really not. You're just a molecular machine. You're a moist robot. Now, if someone were to ask you this question or make this statement, what would you ask them back? Were you free to say that? Yeah, like if someone says all thoughts are determined by the laws of physics, you ought to ask, is that one too? Is this statement caused by the laws of physics? Because if it is, why should you believe it? You're not reasoning to that conclusion. You're just reacting. Again, what you do is you turn the claim on itself to show that this is a self-defeating statement. And an evolutionist of many years ago, J.B.S. Haldane, put it well. He, he realized that robots can't reason, so why believe anything? Here's how he put it. He said, if my mental processes are determined wholly by the motions of atoms in my brain, I have no reason to suppose that my beliefs are true, and hence I have no reason for supposing my brain to be composed of atoms. <laughs> right? You guys see where he's going with this? He's understanding the self-defeating nature of materialism. But nobody, and I mean nobody, said it better than C.S. Lewis, and I can't see it any better than C.S. Lewis, so I'm just going to show you what he said this is a two-slide quote, so stick with me. Lewis points out that if materialistic atheism is true, if you're just a molecular machine, then reason is impossible. Here's how he put it. And this is ironic, because what? What do atheists do? They claim to be champions of reason. They've made reason impossible by their own ideology of materialism. Here's how he put it. He said, suppose there were no intelligence behind the universe. In that case, nobody designed my brain for the purpose of thinking. Thought is merely the byproduct of some atoms within my skull. But if so, how can I trust my own thinking to be true? But if I can't trust my own thinking, of course I can't trust the arguments leading to atheism. And therefore have no reason to be an atheist or anything else. Unless I believe in God, I can't believe in thought. So I can never use thought to disbelieve in God. Boom. As John Madden would say. You can't say it better than that. Atheists are stealing from God to argue against him. They can't explain the effect of reason. And yet they're just assuming that reason is on their side. Reason should make no sense if they are molecular machines. If materialism is true. Daniel Dennett, one of the new atheists, believes consciousness is an illusion. One wonders if he was conscious when he wrote this. <laughs> in order to know your consciousness is an illusion, you've got to be outside your consciousness, right? Like, for example, how do you know that you're just having a dream? What has to happen to you? You've got to wake up. You've got to get outside the dream to say, whew, that was just a dream, Right? In order for you to say your consciousness is an illusion, you'd have to have some kind of super consciousness to say that your consciousness is just an illusion. You'd have to be God, in other words. Here's the problem with atheists on these issues. Atheists exempt themselves from their own theories. Right? Daniel Dennett thinks consciousness is an illusion, but he doesn't think his own consciousness is an illusion. He has to use consciousness to write books to say that consciousness is an illusion. This is self-defeating. So reason is impossible if materialism is true. What about orderly natural laws? Why do we need those in order to do science? Well, let's go back to you at 11 weeks. This is you in the womb at 11 weeks. Question, is this animal... Mineral, vegetable, or human? That's human. All right, let's go back even further than 11 weeks. Let's go all the way back to when your mother and your father got together to conceive you. Have you guys had this talk before? <laughs> I see some young people in here, so I'll try and be discreet. I also see some older people in here, so I'll try and be discreet as well, just in case you've forgotten how this works. 
When your mother and your father got together to conceive you, your mother unconsciously perfumed her egg to attract your father, and then your father sent the entire population of the United States. 300 million soldiers toward your mother's egg. And then there was a race, and you won. Don't let anyone ever tell you you're not special. <laughs> you beat out 300 million others. You have blown away anything Michael Phelps has done. Now, seeing some of you limping here earlier makes it hard for me to believe you were the fastest soldier in the gene pool. But you were. Now, your soldier was 20 to 30 times smaller than a grain of salt. Yet it contained half of the 3.5 billion letter genome, your software program, your DNA... All the letters were in the right order. And your mother's egg was about the size of a period at the end of a sentence in an average book. And it contained the other half of the 3.5 billion letter genome, your software program, your DNA. And when your soldier and your egg came together, a new 100% genetic human being was created. You know, you have not received any more genetic information from this point till right now. Your genetic information has just duplicated itself. In fact, there were only four things separating you from adulthood. Time, air, water, and food. Those are the same four things that separate a two-year-old from adulthood. Does this have implications on the abortion issue? Yeah, I think it does. Why do we kill the unborn child in the womb? It's the same genetically as a toddler. They're the same. You say, well, Frank, come on, you can't legislate morality. All right, no extra charge for this. This was the subject of our first book, creatively titled Legislating Morality. All laws legislate morality. Every law declares one behavior right and the opposite behavior wrong. You can't think of a law that doesn't legislate morality. The only question is, whose morality will we legislate? And I don't want to legislate my morality. I don't want to legislate your morality. I want to legislate the morality. The one Thomas Jefferson said was self-evident. The one the Apostle Paul said, the Gentiles are not of the law of the law written on their hearts. Look, if you have a problem with the morality, you don't have a problem with me. I didn't make it up. This isn't my morality. I didn't make this stuff up. I didn't make up the fact that murder is wrong, that abortion is wrong, that rape is wrong, that theft is wrong, that men were made for women and women were made for men. And the best way to perpetuate and stabilize society, which is the reason the, go the government's involved in marriage to begin with, is to legally recognize that man-woman relationship over every other relationship. I didn't make any of this stuff up. This isn't my morality. It's not yours. It just happens to be thee. And if you don't like it, you don't have a problem with me. You have a problem with the creator upon whose nature this morality is derived. All right, no extra charge for that. Let's go, let's go back to this. Thank you, Mom. Thank you. Let's go back to this. From this point till right now, a construction project of astonishing complexity began taking place. Cells began multiplying at a rate of 4,000 cells per second. Brain cells began multiplying at a rate of 100,000 cells per second. For most of you, anyway. <laughs> Some cells became brain cells. Others heart cells. Others lung cells. Some cells went so far across you to become what they needed to become that it would be equivalent to you today walking across the United States alone. And that construction project continues to this very moment. You just made 4 million new red blood cells. You just made another 4 million new red blood cells. You just made another 4... Knock it off! I mean, are you thinking about this? Are you going, Frank, hang on, time out. I gotta, I gotta make new red, red, red blood cells right here. You're not thinking about this at all, right? It's just happening. Why is it happening? Aristotle recognized something 2,400 years ago. He didn't know anything about blood cells, but he did know that all of nature's going in a direction... For example, why does an acorn, if it's properly nourished, always go in the direction of becoming an oak tree? Why doesn't it become an elm tree or a birch tree or a seahorse? You say, well, Frank, it's programmed to become an oak tree. Well, who programmed it? Is, it, is an acorn conscious? Is an acorn in the ground going, all right, what do I have to do to become an oak tree? No, it's not conscious. 
but it goes in a direction consistently. If it doesn't have a mind of its own, yet it reliably goes in a direction, there must be an external mind directing it toward an end. That is what Aristotle called the unmoved mover. Thomas Aquinas came along in the 1200s AD and he said, this is going to be my fifth way to argue for God. That all of nature is going in a direction. If it's going in a direction, there must be someone directing it. Ladies and gentlemen, this is why we can do science. Because nature is going in a direction. Nature is orderly. Natural laws are persistent and consistent. Now notice, this argument for God is not a big bang argument way back when. In fact, Aristotle mistakenly thought the universe was eternal. Yet he still said there's got to be a director, there's got to be a cause for all this. Every, there's got to be somebody keeping all this going. So this is not a historical cause, this is a cause that exists Every single second the universe exists. This is why Paul comes along and he says, in him we live and move and have our being. And Christ holds all things together. And the writer of Hebrews says, God sustains all things by his powerful word. This is why we can do science. If the world wasn't orderly, if these natural laws didn't exist, if cause and effect didn't hold... You couldn't search for causes. In fact, you could do nothing because you wouldn't exist. We're being held together. So, science requires nature to be goal-directed. Why is nature that way? Because there's a mind behind nature. You know, we forget what God does. Yes, God creates. We forget, though, he also sustains. And on certain instances, he intervenes directly in special acts to get our attention. You ought to follow this guy because I'm pouring out miracles through him. That's why you ought to follow Moses. That's why you ought to follow Elijah and Elijah. That's why you ought to follow Jesus and the apostles because they can do miracles. So what's the summary of all this? What is science? A search for causes. Two types of causes. Natural causes, non-natural or intelligent causes. Two types of science. Historical science, empirical science. What does science say about God? Nothing, because science doesn't say anything. Scientists say things. One other quick example of this, we'll go to your questions here in a minute. You ever wonder why you get, you've gotten conflicting advice on COVID? You say, follow the science. Which science? Look, if scientists have good data and they interpret it properly, you'll get good advice. If they got good data and don't interpret it properly, you'll get bad advice. If they got bad data, doesn't matter how they interpret it, you're going to get bad advice. If there's a political agenda, no, that'll never happen. <laughs> Scientists are just as susceptible to the big three motivators that can pull any of us off track. What are the big three? Sex, money, power. That can corrupt any of us. Scientists are just as susceptible to that as anyone else. So, why does science need God? Well, first of all, you need an orderly universe. And you need reliable cause and effect. And without somebody ordering it all that and keeping it all going, you couldn't do science. So let me give you the five points I hope you take away from what we just talked about. John, you can come up now because we're just going just gonna to go through these five real quickly. We know God by his effects and science is a search for causes of effects. Some effects discovered by scientists provide evidence for an intelligent cause. It's not a God of the gaps argument. As Steve will say, once you have a message, you've got positive evidence for an intelligent cause, not just a lack of a natural cause. Two, knowing how something works doesn't explain its origin. Just because we're really good techno with technology shouldn't get you to believe that just because scientists who are really good at making iPhones or any other technology, that they know how we got here. Thirdly, since all data needs to be interpreted, science doesn't say anything scientists do. And atheists often interpret wrongly because they ruled out the one type of intelligent cause or the one type of cause out of two that exist. They've just ruled it out. Number four, science would be impossible without orderly, goal-directed natural laws. And such laws, I think, are best explained by God. Finally, this is a new point. There is no conflict between the Bible and the natural world. There may be conflict between some interpretations 
of the Bible and the natural world. Remember, God has written two books. What are the two books? The Bible and creation, the Bible and the natural world. So let's end with Sir Fred Hoyle, who was an atheist. He said this, a common sense interpretation of the facts suggests that a super intellect has monkeyed with physics as well as chemistry and biology, and there are no blind forces worth speaking about in nature.